So, uh, shall I go ahead? Yes, please. All right. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, there's been plenty of uh, Zoom talks and webinars which are happening. Loads and loads of documents of guidelines and alleged evidence on all things COVID and things are getting rather overwhelming. They have already got overwhelming. So uh, it's fair enough to ask, you know, yet another talk on hernias and it, it might feel that this is so irrelevant today. Uh, maybe, maybe, but uh, we're just hoping that uh, we see better days when we can again start uh, thinking and working towards solving problems of regular people, you know, people not dying on ventilators and not having severe breathlessness and fever and worried about what will happen tomorrow to their families. So this is essentially uh, with that hope uh, and maybe it's not yet time to say that doomsday has arrived. Um, science is pretty, uh, I think, well proven in terms of delivering. So I will still retain my faith in science being able to deliver a solution. Maybe that solution may not come as soon as we want, but I'm sure that many lives will be saved but unfortunately, a lot of suffering would also have uh, been experienced by many of us. So if you're not uh, up to it, uh, I mean, it's completely fine to just zone off, go off and watch a movie or do some exercise. But in case uh, this subject interests you, uh, and as a diehard hernia aficionado, it is very, very interesting to me. I will basically now uh, take you through the very new uh, stapled ETEP approach. So let me start my talk. It's not a very long talk and I trust that things uh, will make sense, but uh, I hope that you uh, all will have a basic idea uh, of what ETEP is. I mean, without that, this will probably be a little difficult to understand, mm, but I'm, I'm sure most of you uh, would probably know what an ETEP is. All right, so <clears throat> let me start by sharing greetings from my hospital. CMRI in Kolkata, where I have a department uh, which is focused on hernia surgery as well as other surgeries. Now, what is the concept? What is this subject all about? Okay. Now, those used to IPOMs and onlays, we are basically looking at a retromuscular approach. We are creating a common retrorectus space. And along with the creation of that space, we want to recreate the linea alba, wherein we expect there to be significant weakness because of multiple defects or a single large defect or diastasis. And we want to place the mesh in the extraperitoneal or retromuscular compartment, protecting it from bowel. This is the basic concept of the classic reeve stopa operation. Okay, this is uh, something many of you will be familiar with. And though the reeve stopa is now considered to be the gold standard for all ventral hernia operations, there are some criticisms. Wound infections and wound seromas are issues. And ultimately, it's an open operation. So not many patients or surgeons are too keen on an open operation unless it's absolutely unavoidable. Now, 
What about the classic ETEP procedure? The classic ETEP procedure basically tries to replicate the Reeves stopa. All right. Now, in that, we are doing this minimal axis, retromuscular, but doing the same thing as the Reeves stopa operation. Now, there are some criticisms which are now rather well known. Okay. Many uh, critics say that it's an overkill, it's too much of dissection and too much of uh, work for. Well, not enough, uh, you know, in terms of the disease load. And there are complications. So it's not as uh, harmless and happy a procedure as the proponents claim. This is what the critics uh, say. So there are complications. So those complications are not, uh, you know, well publicized. These are criticisms. And of course, ETEP is very difficult. Even ETEP proponents would accept that ETEP is not for everybody. It's a very difficult class of operations. So that part is accepted. There are posterior sheath closure issues. So if you have a long uh, peritoneum and posterior sheath defect at the end of your dissection, you need to close it. So during suturing, you might take bite through bowel or your uh, V-lock suture might invite adhesions or you might have a post-operative fistula because of that, so on and so forth, as well as posterior sheath dehiscence issues in the post-operative period, early post-operative period. It's a very long uh, procedure, so critics say that it can take four hours and I can do this in one hour or 45 minutes in the open technique, why take so long, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the challenges for us when we do ETEP is that the upper port where when we you know, place the camera first is too close to the linea alba. So this is something all those guys who started ETEP know now that that upper port is too close and you have to really literally pull that cannula out into the muscle uh, for you to be able to uh, do the crossover. And in an attempt to do the crossover, you may actually end up breaching or injuring the linea alba. And this increases your complication rate of incisional hernia above uh, the level of your repair or a recurrence. You end up opening the peritoneum when you're doing a crossover. And that can be a big issue because suddenly you have pneumoperitoneum, you have very little space and you struggle. So uh, this is something which is a genuine problem if you open the new uh, peritoneum. So. Now, it's also unfamiliar anatomy to many people. It's ultimately only muscle and fascia and some fat, some vessels. None of them seem to be very familiar, especially when you look from below up or you don't have full triangulation, it can get a little confusing. And if you're used to looking from above downwards, you put the scope from below and look above, once again, it can get confusing, right? So confusion is a common refrain amongst surgeons who embark on doing the ETA procedure. And this is one of the reasons why the learning curve is pretty steep. Apart from that, suturing the linea alba or lateral defects, doing TARS, all these things are pretty advanced uh, and the learning curve is pretty steep. You can get into trouble doing all that. So the challenges that I have personally uh, experienced over the years trying to teach and train uh, my friends, juniors and colleagues, the ETEP ventral a class of operations is that we need to standardize it. So if you see me doing it, it might look different. If you see somebody else doing it, that procedure might look different. So standardization is an important challenge. If we can standardize the operation from step one to step 10, or as I say, step one to 22, then you have more or less established a, a template for the beginning surgeon to 
uh, proceed on those templates. So don't move to step three without doing step two. Don't move to step 17 without doing step 16, things like that. Can we make this difficult and long operation easier and faster? This is the million dollar question. We would love to do it without which I believe that it cannot really be a very popular approach because it will be outside the pale of a generalist and it will be purely the hobby of a specialist, someone who is neck deep into AWR, only that kind of person. And can you give as good outcomes in your patients as I do mine or vice versa? Reproducibility is an important criterion for any good procedure, right? If you look at say PEP, if you look at bariatric surgery, if you look at laparoscopic colectomy, my figures and your figures if we follow the standard principles and procedures of the operation should be the same, give or take a little bit here and there. Can we do that for ETEP ventrals? So this is a big question. We don't know the answer to that yet. Introducing the stapler. So the stapler is the acronym for the stapled ETEP repair. Rather clever, right? Even if I say so myself. Now, <clears throat> let's go to the history. Is this the first time in the history of uh, mankind that someone is using a stapler for doing a hernia repair? No. Actually, in 2013, a group of surgeons, including Ricardo Abdullah and Costa, they first published a transperitoneal approach of doing a staple retrorectus repair. They published it in Spanish. And then in 2016, it got published in hernia. And this is popularly uh, known as the Brazilian technique, okay? And people were very excited. They presented it in Milan uh, in the uh, Global Hernia Summit, and people were very excited about it. In the same year, 2016, David Chen, published a small number of cases, I think he did 10 cases, of the same procedure, laparoscopic uh, stapled sublay repair, and he used the self-gripping mesh, the um, pro-grip mesh. So this is uh, a small series, and since then, the procedures evolved. E-MILOS came in, and MILOS came in, so uh, during a uh, MILOS, which is a small incision, minimally invasive, uh, less open surgery, they use staplers to divide the linea alba, uh, the, the posterior rectus sheath, and create a new linea alba. So this is also been adopted by the MILOS or E-MILOS surgeons, at least the two and a half people on earth that do the procedure. I'm just joking. Now, when we do the stapled ETEP repair, how do we place the patient? The surgeon stands at the foot end of the bed and the legs are split, spread apart and make sure that the knees are far below the level of the hips because when the surgeon operates, he, you don't want the thighs here because his hands will not be able to have the freedom necessary to do the stuff that he needs to do for this operation. So this is another important principle uh, during uh, these operations. So keep the hip as extended as possible, as far below, uh, get the knees down as possible. So in this particular case, let's assume we have an M1, M2 defect, which is high up, then assume a rather narrow rectus uh, of around say seven centimeters, which is okay for an Indian patient. A bigger patient may have up to nine centimeters or so. So draw the linea semilunaris and draw the inferior epigastric vessels from below around five centimeters from the midline, okay? So these are your landmarks for 
replacing the ports. The midline port is a 12 to 15 millimeter. I would recommend the 15 millimeter port here. Uh, why I'll tell you, uh, which is in the midline and it is just at the uh, crease, uh, the crease just above the pubis. Don't put it bang on the pubis because you will probably uh, impinge on the bone while manipulating the stapler. And the two 5mm ports are lateral to the inferior epigastrix and actually, contrary to what the diagram shows, I would place them a little further up and further lateral. It doesn't matter if it is beyond the edge of the rectus abdominis because here you don't have a posterior rectus sheath. So your posterior rectus sheath is going to end at this level, at the level of the arcuate line. So I would place the ports somewhere here, a little above the level of the staple midline port, okay? So this is the port position. So the central port is for the camera and the two accessory ports are for your operating instruments. Now let's look at the procedure. Now, this is a patient with a sub post-CABG incisional hernia. And this is at the level of the M2, which is around, uh, around four centimeters below the z process. Okay. So if you see, there's a liver, there's a stomach, there's a rectus abdominis, the linea alba. Now watch the linea alba. There's a little bit of diastasis here. And this is the gap. It's a small gap filled with omentum. There's no bowel there. And the rectus abdominis is here on either side. And not much of the uh, scan is very, very complex or anything. So we'll just go past this. Okay. So this is the first trocar going by the side of the uh, inferior epigastric, well away. And this is an optical entry. You can see the scope is visualizing the posterior rectus sheath. And this is the extraperitoneal tissue. And you can see now, this is extraperitoneal tissue, all the areolar tissue planes. So just dissecting and trying to find space to put in another lateral trocar. Okay. We are using a ligature, which is a very, very useful instrument in my opinion. And you can see that this is actually a fast forwarded uh, video. And the thing which I would like to say is when you're bringing down the tissues, stay towards the ceiling, okay? As high as possible. Don't do it below because you will go into the peritoneum. So stay high so that you can see the visible muscle and the posterior rectus sheath will be below you, okay? So that is the lateral port. And we just have space now to put in another one. So you can do it from one lateral to the other and then finally put the midline port, which is, typically how I do it. I don't put the midline port initially because I would like to know that the bladder is not stuck there because many of these patients may have a stuck bladder for whatever reason. So now once you have two instruments, again, stay at the ceiling. And so what my left hand is doing is pulling down the peritoneum and the posterior rectus sheath and staying above it. So the areolar tissue is on stretch and I'm using the ligature to just divide very, very quick and bloodless. Now you can see the posterior rectus sheath. Above you can see the rectus muscle and the inferior epigastric vessels. You don't want to get the inferior epigastric vessels anywhere other than the ceiling. So please note that from the outset. <clears throat> so we are dissecting towards the linea alba. <clears throat> Now, why are we doing this? 
we are going to do an ETEP brief stroke operation, right? So we need to get under the muscle and on top of the posterior rectus sheath. So we are showing you uh, taking down this irritating fat, which tends to hang down. We are showing you the full exposure of the arcuate line, the peritoneum and the extraperitoneal space below and above is where the posterior sheath meets to form, join the linea alba on its under surface. So what you're seeing now on either side is the arcuate line and in the midline, you know, at the center of that volcano is the linea alba, the under surface of the linea alba. <clears throat> so in order for the stapler to be deployed, we need to create the retrorectus space and it is anyways part of the surgeon's due diligence when you're doing a reef stopa operation. So the retrorectus space is created and uh, this is done at the level of the sheath. Just use the ligature. You can use a bipolar or a monopolar or whatever else you want. Uh, there's no uh, quarrel about that. So there is often a largish collateral, uh, rather a communicating vessel between the inferior epigastric and the umbilicus. I have said this multiple times. And now we have the stapler going in through the midline 15 mm port and we are firing that, okay? Now, this is the first fire and then the second fire. And typically uh, when I use the uh, endo GIA stapler or the tri staple, I take the heaviest load. So I take a tri stapler, fifth, uh, a black cartridge, because the tissues are so thick that you will not be able to fire it if you use something like a purple. So don't use a purple stapler or an endo GIA blue, use a black load or at the least a green load. So you can see that now we are using a black load and the articulation allows you to adjust the uh, direction of the cartridge. And you can see now, as we staple, the midline linea alba is formed and a very neat looking posterior uh, staple line on the posterior rectus sheath is formed. So we are creating more space in the retrorectus uh, compartment and firing the uh, stapler again. So at some point when you reach high enough, you will find that the tissues are more thick than you uh, bargain for because that's the area of the zephoid. Now look here, when we divide the PRS, that zephoid yellow blob is that zephoid and it is popping right into the center of the operating field. And we are dividing the PRS on either side of the zephoid. Those are some loose pins, we're just taking them out. Now you might ask, why are we going as far? Because this is a higher uh, level hernia. So this is an M2 hernia. And I certainly don't want a sub zephoid recurrence in this patient. So that's the bugbear of uh, any uh, M1, M2 uh, uh, repair that you can have a kefalad reference uh, recurrence unless you overlap uh, with a mesh much higher than that defect. So because we have not fired the stapler at the level of the zephoid, we are just taking a few running sutures with VLOC and reinforcing that staple line so that uh, it prevents a blowout. Now you don't typically need to do it full length, it's just at the thickest part. So you see now we are reversing it. This is the thickest part of the staple line and the one most likely to be at tension. So we are offsetting that tension by taking a few reinforcing sutures. So now we are measuring that retroactive space all the way from across the zephoid and going uh, all the way up to the arcuate line. You don't need to go to the pubis all the way but at least to the arcuate line. Horizontally, typically an Indian patient would have a 15 centimeter to 14 centimeter wide retrorectus space. So you tailor a mesh of your choice 
I uh, typically use a macroporous polypropylene mesh, like a parietine or a proline soft, whatever it is. And you can see that uh, is the repair, okay? Now, what are the technical issues? As a surgeon, you might ask, what happened to the sac? I didn't see any sac. So you just stapled across it. So what happens to the part of the sac uh, underneath the skin? So will you have a seroma? And when you fire a stapler, can you injure the bowel underneath? What about the contents? I didn't see you take down the contents. So what happens? So here is another video. This is again, optical entry from the uh, supra-inguinal region, lateral to the inferior epigastric. You can see the extraperitoneal fat. You can see the posterior rectus sheath. The rectus muscle is above. And we wait for pneumo uh, to create a little more space. And then you can do some telescopic dissection. And once again, you can see the bare muscle, which is a very important landmark for you and that inferior epigastric at around three o'clock. So the needle localization allows you to put in one five mm port and then take down the fat and the areolar tissue towards the midline so that you can place your 15 millimeter trocar. And the reason you put in a 15 millimeter trocar later on, initially you can just put a five, uh, is because when you use a black stapler, you would need 15 mm trocar. So don't waste a 12 mm. You can start with a five if you have a five mm scope or a 10 if you only have a 10 mm scope and convert it to a 15 mm subsequently. So once again, we are dissecting the extraperitoneal uh, tissues and going straight towards the ceiling. So if you, this is the level of the peritoneum. So if you dissected the level of the peritoneum, you will open up a uh, part of the peritoneum and create a pneumo and you don't want that, okay? So you can see, we are on top of that white facial layer, which is the posterior rectus sheath. And from where you're looking, you're looking from the foot end of the patient. So, which means the patient's left retrorectus is on your right and the patient's right retrorectus is on your left, okay? So uh, we have gone through uh, this part of the operation. So I'm just fast forwarding it a little bit. And so uh, these are uh, some tributaries of the intraepigastric system. This is not the intraepigastric itself. Okay, so some more dissection to get that top of the volcano narrower. Why? Because that is how your stapler is going to work. If it's too much of tissue, your stapler is not going to engage and it might misfire if, you, if there is too much tissue. So what you do is pull that arcuate line down, use the ligature and divide the tissues and small vessels on top of the sheath. So you're creating the retrorectus tunnel from below up. So remember those of you who came in late, we are looking from below suprapubic area, we are looking kephalat towards the z -fold. So the lateral limits are the same. You don't injure the neurovascular bundles or the linea semilunaris. So that is the peritoneum and the fat. And this is below the PRS. You can see the undersurface, okay? So we need to get above that. That is the right plane. When your camera is on the suprapubic uh, port, it is easy for you to eyeball the peritoneum and the extraperitoneal fat, and uh, you'll be tempted to dissect there. Avoid that temptation, climb up towards 12 o'clock, and that is where you will find the right plane, the retrorectus plane. So we are dissecting closer to the linea alba now.
and if your port is too lateral then this is a problem you might face see you're having to negotiate past the rectus and the inferior epigastric so this is one of the things to be uh, wary about too medial would mean your instruments will be uh, clashing too lateral would mean you would need to kind of uh, push past the obstruction created there you can see that the inferior epigastric is climbing into that retrorectal space at the level of the arcuate line okay so i will just go past this not spend too much time there so this is some more retrorectal dissection going on it's such a wonderful plane to be in it's very very uh, nice to be in this plane and this dissection typically from the time i place my port takes 15 minutes and i have timed myself that i'm starting the stapling around 15 to 20 minutes of the operation which is i think uh, at least in my experience it's pretty amazing in terms of time so at this time i would say i'm 15 minutes into the operation so that's the first stapler in the second one so once again those who did not come in early we are using black cartridge that is the thickest cartridge and don't use anything less than green now i was answering this question about the sac and the content so here we have an irreducible hernia containing omentum so we are opening the sac with a hook diatomy careful not to hit bowel underneath but we know there's no bowel because we've done a ct but still we are opening it and reducing it uh, reducing the contents with uh, blunt instruments and at this point you must realize that you have opened the peritoneal sac so you're not going to have pneumoperitoneum okay so before that if you have created your retrorectal space you're going to be okay but otherwise the space would get very very constricted because of the pneumoperitoneum so we are pulling down on the omentum and you can see the pneumo is gradually creating a constriction of that space now i'm deliberately not fast forwarding this part of the operation because this is the specific question which i am answering uh, what happens to the sac what happens to the contents so this is what happens if you want to reduce it and you want to open the sac now watch this neat trick we are using the stapler sliding it below the opening of the sac and firing it so what happens now there is no peritoneal hole once you uh, fire that stapler so the hole is now on top so it is going with the linea alba now okay now the remaining part of the stapling is now going to be more difficult because of the pneumo because the pneumo is pushing the peritoneum against your stapler and the pneumo is also trying to get in between your stapler uh, cartridge blades so what you can do is you can vent the uh, pneumo with a 5 mm or 3 mm port in the uh, palmus point so that can give you some uh, relief from the pressure of the pneumo so you can now see that's the hole of the defect that's a hernia defect and we are now reinforcing that part of the linea alba with a few sutures now this also gives me an opportunity to close the sac the 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 defect containing the sac imbricate that sac just the way we do it in other ventral hernia repairs to prevent the formation of a seroma so you can see that that's the area where the sac is we are running that needle past the sac and 
we will be pulling the sac inwards and just running past it through and through all the way uh, as we consider necessary. So if the defect is bigger, then this would be a bigger challenge. You need to do this more meticulously, more carefully, but otherwise it's very, very easy to do this part. They are very close together thanks to the stapling. So we are nearly done with the reinforcement of the linear alba. And now we are using the scale. And now see this, we have not gone all the way to the Z-foid in this particular case. We have limited the cephalad dissection for a relatively lower hernia. So I have not done the full uh, dissection all the way to the Z-foid. So if I uh, look at the criticism of ETEP as an overkill, you're doing the full retrorectus dissection for a relatively smaller hernia, then this would be uh, something that addresses that criticism. I can do a dissection as far as I need to, not as far as I have to. So I can stop my cephalad dissection at a particular point, And that is another advantage of the stapler. For those who came in later, the stapler is the stapled ETEP repair. Now, the measurement is at the ceiling. For some reason, I wanted to place the mesh at the ceiling. Now, <clears throat> I'm uh, measuring the convexity of the ceiling here, okay? Once again, a macroporous polypropylene mesh. The parietine has become a favorite. This is a proline soft. Now you see that mesh placed at the ceiling and doesn't it look wonderful? I love the look of this. And then we just went it out and that's it, okay? Now, what happens inside? Can you injure bowel? Now, this was one of the early cases. Now you see that we have stapled and taken the omentum at the staple line. So we use ligature and just chopped off the omentum just underneath the peritoneal staple line. Now, since this episode, we have a monitoring cannula inside. So there is a laparoscope which goes inside that cannula. And every time you are firing, we just eyeball it and see that there is no bowel being caught. But this is a great video which shows what can happen if you staple. Uh, and you know what happens is when you open the sac, the pneumo comes up and this uh, brings the omentum along with it. So here it is an omentum that caught uh, that got caught in the staple line of uh, the retrorectus repair. And this is because the pneumo pushed the omentum into the hernia. Okay, so uh, these are the ports. That's a side port lateral to the inferior. That's the 15 mm port. And that's another side port lateral to the inferior epigastric. And that's the limited dissection, okay? So what, what technical issues can happen? Definitely a stapler in any class of surgeries has technical issues associated. What happens if the diastasis is so wide that your stapler does not engage? Point. If the diastasis is more than five centimeters, probably uh, not worthwhile using the stapler. If there is a previously implanted mesh with transfacial sutures and tacks, probably you don't want that stapler to go across the mesh or suture or tack. Agreed, right? How big a defect can you handle it? You can handle any defect, but the stapler is likely not going to be able to fire across a defect more than five centimeters at the most. Now, if you have a wider defect, what you can do is you can staple the midline till the defect, till the sac, cut the sac, reduce the contents, go past the sac and staple the midline past it. So just that central part, you do not do a stapling. Above and below it, you do a stapling. If the defect is say big, then you may do an ETEP tar 
and bring the edges of the defect close uh, together. So that would address that part of the operation. You would still need to suture less. So that is how wide a defect I would do. What are the problems with the stapled extra, uh, with the stapled ETA prepare? Cost. You would need an average of four staplers. You would need an extra trocar and maybe a V-lock suture is needed, right? Even though you're using staplers, you may need a V-lock to reinforce it or suture uh, a hole somewhere. That may be necessary. It's always good to keep that cost in mind if you're cost conscious. You can have a staple misfire and that can be disastrous. So what would happen then is you would have the knife cutting through the fascia, the staples did not lodge. You have a million staple pins lying here and there and your peritoneum is now opened. Uh, that's a mess, right? So you'll have to undo that mess. You'll have to take time and undo that mess. Can you continue doing ETEP? You could, uh, or, or you could convert to an open, whatever makes you happy, but definitely it's a salvageable uh, disaster. Because of the stapling, can we have more recurrence? We don't know the answer to that yet. Can we have a staple line breakdown in the early post-operative period? Because the staple line is holding the PRS together. So can the patient cough and the staple line just break off? Maybe it's a possibility. Can you have a posterior dehiscence? Yes, you could have a posterior dehiscence because any uh, repair that brings the edges of the posterior rectus sheath under some degree of tension can lead to a dehiscence. So I am particular to offset the tension on the PRS by taking a few sutures wherever I think it is necessary. So what is the way ahead? As someone who is propagating this, I think I would need to do a cadaver study to test the tensile strength of the staple line on the PRS and the uh, linea alba and find out the pressure at which the staples are giving way. And then we need to correlate that pressure with the normal highest levels of pressure, intra-abdominal pressure during coughing, sneezing activities, etc. So we need to document this. I think this is an important part of the uh, path ahead. We need to document this. And the other thing to do is after that is to have an RCT of a certain class of ETEP patients, maybe uh, all midline hernias, primary hernias between uh, three and five centimeters or two and five centimeters. And one arm is just regular ETEP, the other arm is staple ETEP. Then you compare the two. So essentially, the stapled ETEP repair is very exciting to me because it addresses a lot of the problems with the standard classic ETEP repair. I love the standard classic ETEP repair. Most of you know it. But trying to teach it to surgeons trying to train surgeons across our communities is difficult. And I find a lot of problems amongst them to learn it. And we always tell them, respect the learning curve. You need to put in time. You can't suddenly watch one uh, Zoom talk or watch one live surgery and then start doing it. It's not happening. Now, this is one way I am thinking of handling the uh, difficulties of the ETEP operation. If the procedure can be more easily learned, more faster, and does not need you to dissect that entire space all the way up to the xephoid or sub -xephoid area, maybe it's uh, a good thing and if I can do it at maybe 30% uh, of the time I need to do a regular ETEP repair, 
Why not? Look at bariatric surgery. Look at colorectal surgery. These were all initially open procedures, then got adapted into laparoscopic, then into robotic. All of them have got widespread popularity because of staplers. So any class of operations, which is technically very challenging and difficult, will become more easy, more popular, and probably safer if we can make the operation simpler and use technology for it. So the use of stapler reduces the need for dissection, for crossover, and we can use uh, less suturing on the ceiling. So all these advantages are there, okay? So if you have any questions or if you have a case you would like to discuss, I'm only too happy to uh, help out, to discuss, and because I learn all the time from you, okay? So thank you very much for your patience. I don't know how many of you watched and uh, whether you could see the video uh, well, uh, whether you understood what I was trying to convey, um, but whatever it is, I'm here to answer uh, questions. I expect that there'll be some, uh, yes, there are some messages. So uh, Dr. Mohammed Khalid from Lucknow, you want the port positions? I showed the port positions one, a uh, central port is 15 millimeter just above the pubis or just superior to the pubis and two 5 mm ports around a couple of uh, centimeters above and lateral to the inferior epigastric, okay? Uh, Ashish Day of Delhi, isn't placing the first port more difficult in the lower abdomen than in the upper abdomen? Uh, not really, not really because you don't have the bladder there. This is basically lateral to the inferior epigastric around uh, two, three centimeters above the level of the pubis. You don't have the bladder and you don't have the peritoneum. So you have the extra peritoneal space as long as you're in, uh, lateral to the inferior epigastric. And once you cross the muscle, you will be in that extra peritoneal space. Just uh, inflate uh, with CO2 and then uh, start doing the telescopic dissection. Okay, so Ashish also has another question. What is the landmark on the abdominal wall from the outside from where you start firing the stapler? If you mean where do I uh, put the port where the stapler goes in? It is just on the edge of the pubic bone or just above it. That is where the stapler goes in. Now, where does the stapler begin firing? As you saw in the video, the uh, place where the arcuate lines join the undersurface of the linea alba, that is where we start firing, right? That is typically maybe halfway between the umbilicus and the pubis. It is variable, three to five centimeters below the umbilicus in some individuals. So that is where you would start firing. Now, what if you can't open the stapler that low? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. If the arcuate line is so far below, then you will not be able to open the stapler that low because your port is in the uh, pubis, right? So what you do then is you divide the arcuate line just uh, under the linea alba medially, take it kefalad a little bit, as much as is necessary before you're able to fire a stapler. So if a stapler cartridge is 60 millimeters, which is like six centimeters, then that is the minimum distance you need from your pubic uh, port, suprapubic port, to engage the stapler. Does that make sense? If you want to use a 45 mm, that is probably even better because then that uh, gap will be less and you will be more comfortable firing a 45, though you will need more staplers. I hope that answers your question, Ashish. <clears throat> So Dr. Mohammed Khalid asks, what's the key point we need to keep in mind while crossing the midline? Though this is the beauty of it. You don't need to cross the midline. The stapler is taking care of that crossover. You understand that? You're starting in the suprapubic, supraingual, extraperitoneal space. You don't have a midline to cross here. 
you already have a set common central area you just need to dissect above the arcuate line on either side pass the stapler and once the stapler fires on both sides then you have the posterior rectus sheath falling below and the linea alba with its staple line above so no need for a crossover that confusion and that difficulty all of it goes so what is the cost of a stapler so the cost of a stapler varies according to uh, the company you uh, use uh, and i'm sure there are uh, other variables as to uh, you know if you're buying in bulk you're buying it from uh, a stockist or whatever you ask your local metronic uh, guys to help you and i'm sure they will uh, give you a good rate uh, to buy your uh, stapler uh in covid environment can we use this uh, please don't this is not uh, the time to do elective ventral hernia surgeries please stay home and say stay safe and laparoscopy or open surgery for that matter is all subject to risk of creating complications for the patient creating infective episodes for our uh, working uh, colleagues your nurses technicians etc and of course for your own self so i certainly uh, would not advocate anybody doing elective hernia surgery at this point um, dr jinesh doshi stapler lines aren't meant to hold on to the distraction forces how do you expect it to do that and give strength very good question this is what uh, we need to answer uh, by doing an animal study and subjecting the staple line to stresses uh, not an animal study sorry a cadaver study and uh, i was planning to do that uh, around this time i was waiting for the ihc mumbai to be over before doing a cadaveric study uh but i guess we'll just have to wait some more time for this pandemic uh, issue to be sorted out but definitely this uh, needs to be done we cannot not do it okay so these are the questions and comments i have got so far if uh, there is anything else i'm happy to answer uh, you can connect with me later or yes i'm 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 ready to uh, otherwise exit yeah maybe just wait for 2 minutes sir let's see if there are any more questions coming in okay sure so if uh, anybody uh, wants to ask uh, live that's fine otherwise i can uh, take your messages and address these questions good questions actually ashish good questions please uh, do give feedback uh, about what you think this uh, procedure is whether it will make etep less formidable easier for you to do or do you think it's just an expensive gimmick Uh, is totally uh, unacceptable for you whatever it is uh, we are all going to learn off each other and i would be very interested to uh, hear from you so if you feel uh, like connecting with me directly and sharing uh, whatever your thoughts are only too happy yes okay so i have uh nice talk nice talk wonderful etc thank you thank you thank you okay dr nukala srinivasa rao if there is a posterior dehiscence uh the mesh becomes exposed to intra abdominal contents doesn't it produce adhesions yes so that is the danger of a post op prs disruption the bowel can just get into the retromuscular space and get trapped between the mesh above and the posterior rectus sheath below and because the intra abdominal pressures are always going to keep building up a lot of bowel can just get spread into that entire reef stopa space and you can if you do not intervene quickly you will end up with a lot of bowel 
going gangrenous and the patient may even have a short bowel syndrome uh, after that. So that is a huge price to pay. And that is why it is so important to be skeptical about whatever one is doing, to question oneself, to question others, not accept anything at face value, and also to realize that, uh, you know, we are never really innovators. I have not invented this. I have just applied something which people already did, and I am trying to adapt it to my own practice, and I'm trying to share with you uh, those lessons, and maybe you can uh, teach me better, or you will have a different uh, feedback. So one of the things we know is if you bring the PRS edges together, whether with sutures or with staplers, that suture line or staple line is going to be subjected, uh, subject to uh, disruptive forces. Those are the same disruptive forces that cause hernia recurrence, uh, suture line to break. So is the staple line strong enough to withstand it? Maybe, but we need to prove it. We need to prove it. So it's a very valid uh, observation that the stapler is not designed to withstand this much of stress. Maybe you're right, but maybe not. Clinically, I can tell you that it's working wonderfully well. These patients are doing fantastically well, but in general, all ETEP patients tend to do fantastically well, uh, or rather most uh, ETEP patients uh, tend to do fantastically well. So uh, I would say these patients probably do a little bit better than those. So that's my personal bias. So unless we do an RCT comparing uh, standard sutured ETEP versus stapled ETEP, we are really not going to be able to answer this question. All right. So uh, Nand Kishor Dukipati of Hyderabad uh, is asking, what is your view using ProGrip Mesh? Uh, the ProGrip is a favorite amongst certain surgeons in Europe and US and maybe in South America. I'm not very uh, aware of uh, too many people using it, but um, the advantage is uh, no need to suture it. The mesh, uh, you can just uh, lay it open and it stays there. Mm, I do not have that much experience with ProGrip in ventrals uh, other than in open ventrals. So I would be keen to try it sometime. Uh, I wouldn't use it on complex repairs, mind you. I don't think uh, polyester is a good material to use in uh, big ventral uh, incisional hernias. For small umbilical epigastrics, I, I think uh, for a restopa operation, it should be fine. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Dr. Doshi comments that the cadaveric study will not show how it heals. Uh, we don't need to see how it heals because the healing is a biologic procedure. Uh, we know how it happens. We just need to see that the staple line is strong enough to withstand a certain amount of, uh, you know, distracting force in kilopascals uh, or whatever uh, units we measure it in. And we need to extrapolate that data with the cadaver studies on this, which have been done already. And with the knowledge of what level of stresses the abdominal wall in life gets to bear. So we just need to uh, kind of uh, bring these facts together and derive, okay? All right. Can you design any in vivo study? Mm, probably uh, we can think about it, yes. Okay, can we have a simultaneous intraperitoneal picture too to reduce complications? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, I had a video clip which I had reserved uh, to show you, uh, but I couldn't find that clip and my technician, uh, because of COVID uh, uh, you know, lockdown, my technician wasn't around, so I couldn't find that video, but I'll show it to you sometime for sure. Okay. Uh, how, Dr. Uh, Doshi asks, how many cases have you done so far? We have done under 15 cases of uh, staple DTEP uh, ventrals. So hoping to uh, increase the numbers once we start working. We were really excited to do a lot of cases, but uh, unfortunately uh, right now I'm not even operating uh, for a month and I probably will have to learn operations all over again. Okay. Um, Does umbilicus cause any issues in the dissection for supraumbilical defect? No, no problems at all. Okay, 
Dr. Yogesh Mehta says, nice talk, enjoy, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for all your uh, good uh, wishes and messages, really appreciate it. And I think uh, we are good. We started at 12 and uh, it's one o'clock. So let's call it a day. Okay. Yeah, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your uh, yeah. time. Uh, sorry for the technical delay that we had to start this program a bit late, but really appreciate your time, sir. And Thank you patience. very much. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you. So viewers, we are stopping this live stream now. If you have more questions, you can please post them on LabGuru and uh, we will try and get them answered later by Ramana, sir. Thank you so much for joining us.